the flush toilet is a good metaphor for the civilization we're living in. You, you, you crap into a pipe, you flush it away, and you never see it. You never have to deal with your own shit. Um, and then you end up deep in it. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. By the end of a year rife with record-breaking weather, we visit British writer and former activist Paul Kingsnorth. In his younger years, he used his body to physically protect nature from the insatiable needs of modern man. He chained himself to bulldozers to prevent them from destroying forests and paving them with asphalt. But now, Kingsnorth says the eco-movement has sold its soul to politics and industry. Sustainability has become this kind of comfort blanket for middle-class people in which they can say, well, I've got a Toyota Prius, you know, and I've got an, or I've got an electric car, and et cetera, et cetera. And you can buy your way into a sustainable lifestyle. Paul Kingsnorth no longer believes the world can be saved. What is left of nature is now being thoughtlessly traded in for wind and solar farms. If you can't recognize this web of life that we are part of is, is anything more than just a resource that you think you can understand and harvest, then you're doomed. King's North has withdrawn to the westernmost part of Ireland to live with his family on a plot of land that he allows to rewild. But he does use a car and electricity because no one is innocent. And that includes you, dear viewer, despite all your eco-ambitions. This is Backlight. Welcome to the world of a recovering environmentalist. So this is a, uh, a wind power station, euphemistically known as a wind farm, up on, uh, up on the mountains in County Galway in Ireland. This is a relatively small one, actually, compared to a lot of others. It used to be the case that environmentalism and green campaigning involved being against the industrialization of mountains, but now it's in favor of them as long as the industrialization doesn't produce carbon. And the reason for that is that we tell ourselves that this is going to save us. Um, that the solution to climate change and the ecological crisis that's unfolding is simply to replace coal and oil burning power stations with this kind of thing, this uh, low carbon alternative. Um, there's a few problems with that. One of them is that there's no way that you can actually build enough of these things and enough solar arrays and barrages in the rivers and wave machines in the sea to power the global economy at the rate that we consume at the moment the technology isn't available. You would have to smother the landscapes of Europe with these things to get anywhere close, um, even to the state of the economy at the moment. But the other problem is more of a, a, a philosophical one, if you like, which is that this is the mentality that caused the problem in the first place. Here we are assuming that the problem we've got is simply the emission of the wrong kind of gas, and that the solution to that is to paper the wild landscapes of Europe in, in more industry, all of which is, is, is metals, is plastics, is cement, all of which is mined and transported from the rest of the world and buried in huge concrete bollards right up on the top of a mountain here. That's the same mentality that got us into this mess in the first place. This just seems to me to be a betrayal of what everything was about. To me, these places are just a symbol uh, of what went wrong because I have, such a, I have such a passion for open landscapes and mountain landscapes, even very bleak ones like this. This just seems to me to be a betrayal of what everything was about. And environmentalism is not just about protecting landscapes, it's about having a, 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 a correct relationship with the rest of, of, of life on Earth. There goes the deer. I don't know what they think about the sound, the noise of these things is incredible. Um, oh, you know, we haven't even talked about the destruction of bird life. Uh, a, a huge amount of bird life is destroyed by these things. There goes the deer. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's also what some people say, what you call the neo-environmentalist, is that, you know, nature has ways of uh, adapting, you know, there's still deers running around, the birds will find other ways to survive or adapt. Or, What, what do you think of, of that? That's one of these, the answers to... Well, that's, to me, that's a psychopathic attitude. That attitude is... What is, what is the psychopathic well, attitude? Well, th the attitude that nature will adapt so it's fine. Is, is the attitude that's been used by rapacious destroyers of the natural world for centuries. Yeah, sure it will adapt, of course it will, yes. Um, but it will be poorer and there will be less of it and it will be entirely centered on humans. And I keep coming back to the same question. Are we going to act as if this planet belongs to us and we can do what the hell we want and everything else will just fit in around it? Or are we going to start saying, well, maybe, just maybe, we ought to put ourselves not at the center of the picture, but just as part of a wider web. How would we live? if we thought that other creatures had a right to this as well, that we didn't have a right to create technologies which destroy the bird life, that we didn't have a right to dig out the fossil layer and burn it, that we didn't have a right to just effectively assume that all of this is just a backdrop to our activities. Isn't that depressing? <laughs> Isn't it depressing? Depends how you look at it, I suppose. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult, isn't it, to look at the state of the world and not be depressed about it sometimes, or unhappy. Um, you can't honestly look at the state of things and not be unhappy. Some of the most despairing people I've ever met have been climate scientists because they know what's really going on. Um, so if you're not unhappy or, or, or worried or depressed about it at least part of the time, then you're not paying attention. Um, but, you know, you can't live in that space all the time. You have to get on with your life, it's fine. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult time to be a human in that sense, isn't it? Because we know what's happening and we know how little it's possible to do about it. Um, so we just do what we can do. We do what we can do with our lives um, and we see what happens. I mean, you know, the good thing is the future is never, is never predictable. And the planet is very complex and we don't know exactly how it's going to react to anything. So we don't know exactly what's going to come. So we just uh, we do the best thing. But to me, the big question is not what technologies are we going to use to continue the same trajectory. It's how do we change the trajectory? And yeah, I don't hear that question being asked in a significant way uh, in as many places as it should be, even now. OK. Writer Paul Kingsnorth was one of the heavyweights on the environmentalist scene, reaching a wide international audience with his passionate pleas. Both in his native England and on the other side of the planet, he protested against the insatiable hunger of globalizing mankind. But one day, he realized he couldn't save the world. Together with his wife, a former psychiatrist who gave up her work too, he has withdrawn from it. Now they grow their own vegetables and homeschool their children. There. The interesting thing about kids when you have them, especially if they're running around in, in the fields, which ours do a lot of, is you see that they already have this intense, intrinsic relationship with everything else anyway. It's not theoretical, they just, they notice things, they have this great you know, they, they see the, the spiders on the underside of the leaves and they see the colours of the grasses and they see when something has changed and my daughter sees fairies in the trees and is absolutely sure that they're real. And, you know, they notice things that you don't notice. And as you're an adult, as you become an adult, the process of growing up is a process of teaching yourself that none of that stuff is real so that you can go and live in civilization. Because if you could remember that intense relationship with nature that you have as a kid, it would be heartbreaking when you had to live in the middle of London and sit in an office all day. He, he likes pecking. There. Hello, Pedal. Look, you're being filmed. You're on TV, look. The famous chicken. Let's go. Hey, hey, 
doesn't want to be stroked. They do a lot of learning in their home school about a huge amount of nature work, science, observation. It's just about how life works and how it's interconnected. My wife is great at teaching that. Um, she has a science background, so she can she can really bring that bring that in. But you know, just just learning where you are in the web of life is a big deal, actually. So I want you to have a look at them and decide. What do you think? Do you think that could be a, a human? Chimpanzee, answer? definitely. You think that's should, why, it's why not, is it chimpanzee? It has, it's, it hasn't got a towering forehead. Yeah. This looks because it looks very like a chimpanzee. It has got a it's got a very sloping forehead. This I think is vexed because it's got a small it's got a smaller towering forehead. And this is even has a bigger even bigger brain case than a So do you think even, this is us? Yeah, I think. Do you think that one's us? us? And what about this one? Um yeah, that's massive. Yeah. I think that's a model, that's not even real. Yeah, it is. It looks like a new bird. Mm. This is a place we bought four and a half years ago now. We wanted to have a place we could afford with no mortgage and no rent, a place that we could heat ourselves with our own fuel, take our own water out of the well in the garden, feed ourselves as much as we could, school our own kids, um, just live a life that's a little bit more rooted and a little more real than the one we were living before in, in the town and in the city in England. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, quite a lot's happened in four years. It looks pretty different now to what it looked like when we first came. All of the trees that you can see around here with the exception of the very big ones there in the background have all been planted by us. I think we've planted about 800 trees since we got here. The minute you plant trees in a place, it becomes very hard to leave, I've discovered. It becomes very hard to leave because you, you watch them grow. They're growing like your children at a, at a faster rate. Um, the place that you're in stops just being a bit of land you bought that you could sell again and starts becoming something that you're actually part of. It's very interesting. And trees in particular have that effect. Yeah, the chickens are keen to take part. What it turned out we wanted to do more than anything was just rewild the place. We feed ourselves from the garden and from the polytunnel most of the year now. Um, and the more food we learn to preserve, the more we can hopefully feed ourselves with our own food to become as self-sufficient as we can, just because it's a useful insurance policy and because it's enjoyable. The other thing you discover about just, just farming, running your own place, having a small holding is um, you just have to enjoy it, actually. It's not something you can do because you think you ought to or because you think it's going to apocalypse-proof you. You actually have to want to. Um, and having been here nearly five years, I can't imagine, can't imagine going back and living in a town not having any land. We have the polytunnel, which has been here about a year now, um, and which has fed us really well this summer. Uh, a very good year. Again, things are dying out now, but it's October and we've still got tomatoes. And we've had any number of beans, beetroot, chard, uh, aubergines, would you believe, in the west of Ireland. Things are definitely changing. Yeah, it's very strange. This is late October. I could be standing here in a t-shirt. It ought to be a lot colder than this. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly changing. Things are going. Things are things are shifting in in unaccountable ways. And anyone will tell you that. But yeah, we'll we'll see where that leads us. And standing here, the, thinking of that, does it still make you sad or angry or what? What, what does it make you feel? Um, it doesn't make me, I don't think it makes me angry because climate change is so diffuse that it's difficult to know who to be angry at. If I was going to be angry, I'd have to be angry at myself for driving a car and using electricity and all the other things that we do. Um, climate change is, a, is a, an enormous accident that's happened to us that we've just created by living in a certain way and we've now got to a point where we don't know how to get out of it. Um, but there is an enormous grief that lies underneath it that we don't allow ourselves to look at, I think, very often. We can read news every day about the melting ice sheets and the collapsing glaciers and the desertifications in Africa and the hurricanes in the Americas. We can read about the extinction and the climate change and we're just small people and there's little, if anything, we can do. And so it can raise a great despair in people, and it does. And I think it's one of the reasons that we like to avoid even looking at it, because it's, it's not a problem with a solution. 
actually. And that's one of the things that we're having to deal with. It's a predicament we have to live through. And we're all responsible for it. There aren't any bad guys to blame. There are some people who are more responsible than others. But it's, there's no enemy out there that you can blame for it. And does uh, living like this help or would it help other people as well? Or is it just your way well, of, I mean, of it's, uh, um, hiding? Well, I am hiding to a degree. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend I'm not. Um, certainly I'm hiding from the kind of worst excesses of the culture I grew up in, but I mean, living here allows, I mean, look, living here allows us to have some element of peace. It allows us to bring our kids up in a way that we think is appropriate for the times. It allows us to teach them about this. It allows them to spend as much time as they can in nature as possible, which hopefully might make them useful or at least understanding when they grow up. It allows us to, you know, plant a thousand trees which weren't here before. So there's useful work that you can do, um, but it's not going to stop climate change. Nothing's going to do that. Carefully stack it up there. When I was a young activist, we used to say, look, if we don't act within this period of time, there's going to be a catastrophe. That's been the message of the environmental movement for 30 years. Everyone stopped listening because they were fed up with being told there was a catastrophe around the corner if they didn't change. Your fingers. I've got young children, and I used to think that maybe they'd be old or uh, even dead by the time that things really got bad, but I'm not sure anymore. So we're in it and we have to learn to live through it. And okay. we're not really equipped for that because Shut the doors. of the story of progress that we yeah. believe in. There, you go. there we are, good work everyone. It seemed to me for years that the notion of progress is the religious story that we tell ourselves in Western civilization. It's the story that everything will keep getting better because it just has to. And the more I look around me, the more I think that we don't really know how to deal with the possibility that that might not be true. Brilliant. Has that got a name? Mm. Foxes. Foxes. That's kind of what I call it first. Brilliant. That's your working title, isn't it? Do you ever miss like city life? No, generally not, no. I was busy working as a consultant psychiatrist then, and that was a huge amount of driving and um, weekends working. So it took a bit of adjustment to sort of being unstructured with my time or having to structure myself. But um, yeah, I, I, find, I would find it very hard to go back into that now. Yeah. <laughs> and do you ever talk about climate change? Not really, but we do think about it, yeah. You see it happening a bit, don't you, with the warm yeah. summers and all that. Mm. So what do you what do you think what do you what is climate change actually? Do um, you know that? It's probably all the um cattle's farting. <laughs> and all the pollution. That's a good answer. And all the pollution. That's a good so answer. So the cows farting and the pollution. Yeah, there's some major cows farting around here, aren't there? <laughs> They're everywhere. Mm. We're surrounded by them. And does it worry you this farting of the cows or? Um I can't smell it, but it's a bit. <laughs> but you talk about it uh, a lot? Or, or, or is it also something that's... We, we do, talk, yeah, we do talk about it because it's hard to, especially when we're learning together, because it's hard to study some things without referring to it, especially when we're outside and we learn a lot outside. So, yeah, but also trying not to focus on it too much because they need to sort of you know, feel they've got a future to enjoy as well. So, yeah, I'm trying to find a balance. Activism is predicated on finding an enemy. So you find the bad guys and then you go out and you campaign against the bad guys in any number of different ways. But what if you're the bad guy? 
What if you are the one on the aeroplane? You are the one driving the car. You are the one using the central heating. You are the one doing the things that, is, that are destroying the planet, which you are. And I am, and everybody watching this is, right? And that's not a blame game. It's not anyone's fault. We're just born. We're just living our lives. But by being born into this world, we are part of the problem that we are creating. That's why they always want the solutions button. That's why they always want some guy to come along and go, good news, I've invented free endless power forever. And you just press this button and you don't have to change anything, but the planet's going to be fine. Well, it isn't. You've got to pay the price for it. And that's the problem. We're not prepared to change it. We think that we can continue to eat the cake and not get fat. So I think we have to go through whatever is coming somehow in order that we can come out the other side of it and pick up the pieces and say, well, what, what might be a better way to live than that? So the orchard. They're apples and pears. And they're composted with our own manure from our compost toilet, which um, you'd be surprised how, how fragrant that is. Um, that is. That is what went into our toilet a year ago and sat in a compost heap with uh, sawdust and a few leaves for a year and has transformed itself into incredibly rich soil. One of the first things we did when we got here was tearing out our toilet um, and replacing it with a compost toilet, which I built myself, which is literally just a big bucket. The modern toilet, the flush toilet, is a good metaphor for the civilization we're living in. You crap into a pipe, you flush it away, and you never see it. You never have to deal with your own shit. Um, and then you end up deep in it. But I just think it's um, the notion that you just press a button and all of your waste disappears and somebody else deals with it somewhere and it's probably all gonna be okay is exactly how we just grow up. We live our lives like that. For as long as I can remember and for much longer than I've been alive, there have been fantastical promises of technological salvation. And we get them now from Silicon Valley. We hear that we can upload our consciousness into machines so we don't have to live as physical beings or there'll be lab-grown meat for everyone in a few years' time or, or nuclear fission, I believe, is still around the corner any minute now. Um, hyper solar power, etc., etc. None of it ever quite comes to pass. It's always something that's just around the corner that we have to keep progressing towards. It's a salvational narrative. It's like it really feels like a, a narrative of religious salvation, like we will get you to heaven. It's like the narrative of colonizing Mars. That's a wonderful one. We'll all go and live on Mars. It doesn't matter that we've destroyed the Earth. We'll go and build a new planet on Mars, built for and by humans. Um, it's a psychotic narrative, that one, as far as I'm concerned. It's psychopathic. The notion that it's, well, we've, we've killed off the only living planet that we know of in the entire universe. Never mind. We'll go and somehow rustle up another one out of some dead dust, if it were even physically possible, which it isn't. Um, what kind of... What are you saying about who you are as a person, as a people, if that's what you think is a good idea? Instead of staying here and trying to work out your relationship with the rest of life, you're going to go somewhere else and just start again with the same problem. people talk about solutions to the ecological crisis, what they usually mean is we can find some technological way of not burning fossil fuels, or maybe we can invent a giant vacuum pump that will pull the CO2 back down out of the atmosphere. Maybe you can, probably not. It's worth saying that it is not possible at this moment in time to produce anything like the energy that the global economy produces without oil. more than that, the question is what's the problem you're solving? What do you think the problem is with this society that we've got to this point? I don't think it's a technological problem. I think it's a, it's a cultural problem, even a spiritual problem that we've got in our relationship with the rest of life, in our relationship with our own uh, desire and our own greed and our notion of what we mean by progress, which is usually very narrowly defined. Um, 
to me, there's a kind of spiritual emptiness at the heart of it. We don't really know what relationship we want to have with the earth. Um, and you can, okay, maybe you can fuel your capitalist growth society on solar power instead of oil, but you've still got the same problems in terms of the world that you're eating, um, the amount that you're consuming, the values that you have, uh, the individualism, the, the kind of digital narcissism that we have as a culture. It's not a healthy culture we live in. Over many years, the environmental movement, for a number of very good reasons, um, started moving away from that position that nature can be defended for the sake of itself, that we should just protect this forest because it's a forest and we shouldn't destroy it for the same reason. Um, and they started moving towards a, a rationalist position, an economic position, because that's what they thought they had to do to get things done. So they would go to governments and they would start using um, uh, econometric principles and discussions and they would start saying well you know we should protect this forest because one day we may find the cure for cancer in here or we should protect this forest because it's uh, drawing X tons of carbon out of the atmosphere every year all of which may be good reasons to protect a forest that's fine but actually they're not the reason they're not the reason I can understand why people talk to governments and corporations like that but what happened with the green movement in my view is that it fell into a trap that was set by those who didn't want it to succeed which was to say, if you want to talk to the people in power, you have to use their language and the assumptions their language is based on, which is that all of that stuff out there is a natural resource and we have to use that natural resource sustainably. And that's all fine, but that can all be worked out in a calculative fashion. And we don't want to hear any of your discussions about ecocentrism or the, 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 the intrinsic value of nature or your spiritual connection to the land or any of that sort of hippie rubbish we've got you know we've got sensible grown-up things to talk about nature is fine as long as it contributes to economic growth and the problem of course is as soon as you buy into that language you've brought into the whole conversation about how we live in a growth-led rationalist society and then if somebody can provide a better reason to destroy a forest for example um well, uh, look, there's oil underneath this forest, so if we take the forest down and turn the trees into toilet roll and dig up the oil, it will be a greater contribution to economic growth. And we can put some wind farms up over here, which will compensate for the carbon that we emit. And there's the rationalist hypothesis. And if you've already given up on the idea that there's anything inherently valuable in that place, you haven't got an argument. You haven't got an argument. You can't say, but look, it's a forest. We shouldn't be, dis you can't do it. There's, it's gone. It's very pearly, isn't it? Yeah, that's nice. That's another type over there. Yeah, look. It should be wet. I think we should come later in the year as well. Oh, yeah, I've done them before. It's got a dent in the top, though. Mm. And lots and lots of little brown markings all over it. When I was young, when I was a child, I used to spend a lot of time uh, walking across mountains and moorlands and cliffs um, with my dad who was a long distance walker we used to do a lot of these long distance paths in Britain all over England and Wales and parts of Scotland being sort of dragged forcibly up the mountains um, which wasn't always enjoyable especially when you're young you know you're you're climbing up some mountain in the pouring rain and wanting to be at home um, so it's not always um, a kind of bucolic experience at all, but it is very formative. You spend a lot of your time outside and you spend it watching the sun go down over the cliffs or seeing the owl um, diving at you at night as you walk across the moors. For most people I know who become environmentalists or campaigners or just writers or conservationists or anything, that kind of experience is at the heart of what they do. 
um, because it's just a bit, it's a bit about love and connection and attachment and you, you see the world beyond your little human self. And you can have a look at it when you get home. Like a lot of people at university, I kind of became politicised and quite radical as you do when you're 18. Um, but at that time there were uh, a lot of road protest actions going on around Britain. And I just went along to some of them and I started to get involved in them and I started to chain myself to things and get arrested and, you know, try. I got involved in a quite a radical but also very rooted direct action movement which, which, which brought together this kind of love of place and landscape and history that I've always had with a sense that you can do something to stop it, um, which, which you could in a very physical way in those days. You know, they want to build a road through here, you put yourself in front of it, it's proper. A sort of Gandhian or, you know, US wilderness style direct action. Half a mile away, anger at the inexorable progress of the Twyford scheme had turned to more direct protest. Campaigners hacking away a riverbank to flood the site and climbing onto machinery to hang their protest banners. Police, who were heavily outnumbered, waited until reinforcements arrived to make arrests. There were scuffles as 11 people were detained, mainly to face charges of criminal damage. At the heart of that is not politics. This, that's the important thing for me. Um, we, we, we talk about activism or environmentalism as if these were kind of political movements, and in, in some senses practically they are, but actually they're about protecting things that you love and have a passion for. The Green Movement originally was not left-wing and it wasn't right-wing either. It was supposed to be at least an attempt to move beyond that division and say, look, let's put the interest of life as a whole at the heart of our politics rather than arguing about the various uh, power dynamics that the left and the right argue about. But the Greens now have been kind of subsumed into the political left uh, to a really, really dangerous degree, I believe, because what that's done, if you look at the issue of climate change, is that in the States, for example, particularly, but not just there, climate change and protecting the natural world as a whole are now seen as left-wing issues, which they're not. They're not left or right. They're, they're, they're something that all humans should be concerned with. But because environmentalism has become very leftish, a lot of people who aren't leftish can then represent it as something that those socialists want us to do. So that's why you get this kind of ludicrous climate change denial on the political right. Um, protecting nature is now seen as a, as a partisan issue, which it isn't and shouldn't be. So that's one part of it. And the other part of it, of course, is that it didn't take very long for business to see that there was money in sustainability, right? So you've got this lovely word sustainability, which originally was a radical notion, which originally was, hey, we should live within our means, people. We should not live in an economy or a society which takes more than it can give back and which destroys the rest of life in order to feed ourselves. We need to be sustainable, otherwise it all falls apart. Um, now, very quickly, that became something you could sell. You can you can sell sustainability now. You can you can tell everybody that your product is sustainable and they should buy that one and not the other one. Uh, every corporate boardroom in the world now has got a corporate sustainability officer who effectively is greenwashing the company and pretending that it's more ecological than it is. And sustainability has become this kind of comfort blanket for middle class people, in which they can say, "Well, I've got a Toyota Prius," you know. And I've got an, or I've got an electric car, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can buy your way into a sustainable lifestyle. Stephen, okay. don't forget the binoculars. Now, Leela, just be Please quiet. Now, Mummy is going to tell you about mycelium, and then I've got an exercise for you. Okay. So we've been looking at mushrooms, haven't we? Yeah. The parts of the fungus that are above ground. So actually, most of the fungus is underneath us, and we can't see it, can we? It's a huge you know network of pipelines. They can sense, or they think they can sense, what kind of animal is walking on the forest floor. Wow. Right, so imagine that this whole forest floor is connected, right? All the trees are connected, and so it's almost like yeah. a carpet. They kind of And they, they, it is like a carpet, and it's yeah. sensitive, and it's got a kind of intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So it can tell the difference between a deer walking into the forest and a human walking into the forest and the mycelium sends signals to the tree. So if, for example, there was a deer walking into the forest that loves to eat the leaves of a certain tree, 
the mycelium will be able to send signals to that tree, and that tree can secrete some chemicals that the deer doesn't like to eat. Is that true? So think about that. When you go walking to the woods, the trees know that you're there, yeah. right? Because the mycelium are sending them signals. When I just sit on my acre of land and attempt to cut the wood and side the grass and listen to the birds, I'm not attempting to live in the past. I'm just attempting to have some connection with the world as it is in the present. This is, this is here. This is not the past. This is what life is. Life is all around us. Uh, we are still all dependent upon agriculture. We're still all dependent on, on, on the, the air and the water and the earth and the soil and everything that moves and lives. We haven't gone into some techno utopia. We're never going to. We're still animals in the world. Um, so how can we have some sort of small, small relationship with that? All I'm doing personally is trying to do that for myself and my family. So it's very selfish, really. I'm not pretending that I'm setting any examples for anybody. People are endlessly asking me, how can everybody else live like you? And I say, well, I didn't say they could. You know, I, <laughs> I want everyone else to live like me. This bit's... But, but how can you live in a way that we, the people used to do in, in the past? Because mm. that's, of course, the criticism these neo-environmentalists throw back at you, mm. that you're romanticizing the past. Why would you do that, Paul? Why are you doing well, that? Well, I'm not living in the past, I'm living in the present. Uh, that's, that's why I've got a car and an internet connection. Um, there's a, the, the progressive narrative has a real problem with anything that appears to be emulating the past or anything that draws on the wisdom of the past or anything that has roots in the land or anything that has a connection with nature because that's all seen to be... We, we put that in a box labelled reactionary romanticism and we put it over there and we say the future is... Uh, the future is high-rise factory farms and, and genetically modified meat and all the other things that these people have decided the future is going to look like. That's not the future. We don't know what the future looks like. We've no idea what the future looks like. That's the progressive myth. There's much growing in the conifer wood, do you think? Well, we, we were doing, they've got a conifer plantation and there was fly agaric in it. Do you think we should come down here and steal a Christmas tree? Well, no, because they noticed. <laughs> Hey, there is! Uh, what lovely glade are you talking about, monkey? Why would you have children if you think the world is collapsing? Well, it's a question that supposes that you have children for rational reasons, isn't it? As if we were kind of making a calculation. <laughs> well, I won't rationally have children. I mean, you have children because, you, you know, you love each other and you want to have children. That's how it works. And nobody knows what the future is, so hey. you, you give them the best of what you can give them. And uh, who knows, they might turn into ecological superheroes and save the world. That'd be nice. That's, uh, or they might not, but you know, it's mm. just you, you do your, you do what you do. So I suppose you just try and equip them the best that you can. So they, I want them to have a sort of understanding of yeah how everything works and fits together in a way, and about how it's chaos with small parts of order within it, and um, and then they might be able to use some of that you know in their daily lives to understand. All sorts of things, yeah. But there is always a worry. No, you always worry about yeah. what kind of future they're going to have. Oh, you saw a beetle? With a leg and a long nose. He was on here. I oh, heard. yeah, I got a beetle on there as well. Yeah, he's really cute. I wonder if I got one. Did you write about the mushrooms up there? Do you still sometimes experience moments of great despair? For example, looking at Trump doing his Trumpian things mm. or... Well, actually, I, I'm, less, I'm less angered by Trump being Trump than I am by environmentalists flying to climate change conferences, actually, to be honest. I mean, they're both damaging, but at least Trump doesn't pretend he isn't. Um, say what you like about him, he's not, uh, he's not subtle in that regard. Um, look, mostly I'm at a, at a point where I'm, I just accept where we are and then we just have to live through it. Sometimes, yeah, plenty of things still make me angry. I see the latest climate change report or I see the trees being sawed down in my local neighborhood and it's still upsetting. Of course it is, but you know, it's just, all that's changed for me is I've relieved myself of the responsibility of trying to change the world or save the world anyway. Um, because I don't believe that it can be saved in the sense that we can stop the climate changing and prevent the extinction and go back to living in a kind of happy, clappy, global liberal democracy because that's not going to happen we're in for enormous changes so we just have to be open to that see where they take us
that you end up thinking that there is an answer in spirituality, even though that's a, almost a dirty word. Yeah, um, I, would, I would never use the word spirituality openly. <laughs> I just did, whoops. Um, no, I mean, here's what I think now. This is the conclusion I've come to, which has made me uncomfortable, but also strangely liberated. It's that this is the, the, the crisis we're going through, the ongoing collapse of the natural world that we've created, and the likely collapse of the culture that we're in as well over the next hundred years or so as a result of that is, is at its core, it's a spiritual crisis. Um, because we are the, got to be one of the only cultures or societies or civilizations that have ever existed that don't have something sacred at the core of them. We don't have a religion in the broad sense of the word, but more, more than that, we don't have a sense of anything that's greater than us that we have to bow our knee to, that we have to humble ourselves before, whether it's a god or a goddess or the, 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 the divinity in nature itself, we don't recognize those terms really. We see them as antiquated, we see them as old-fashioned and backward and reactionary. We have part of the myth of progress that we believe in is the notion that we're evolving beyond religion, that there's something primitive about that sense of the sacred. I don't think there is. Um, and I've, it's been a long journey for me to realize that, that if, if we don't have anything that we believe is, is above us, then we become destroyers, which is what we've become. We put ourselves at the center of the world and we become these, these individuals that just eat the world. Um, and the conclusion, if there is a conclusion, maybe it's not a conclusion, maybe it's just a step on a road. But the place I'm in at the moment is that if there's going to be any future for the kind of culture we're in or the, whatever it turns into, it's got to be in finding some sense of the sacred in, in nature itself. It's got to be going back to or going forward to some almost pagan or animist sense of the divinity in everything, the, the, the gods in the sea, the gods in the stones, the, 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 the spirits of the air. I don't know what you would, how you would put it, but if you, if you can't recognize that this web of life that we are part of is, is anything more than just a resource that you think you can understand and harvest, then you're doomed. We're all animals. We're all the, identical to the people who, who painted the, 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 the Paleolithic cave walls 30,000 years ago. Um, we haven't changed biologically at all, or very little. We're still wild creatures. We've never been domesticated. So we can put this patina of civilization on us, but it can fall away very quickly. So what's underneath it? And how do we get back to that? The reason that these passions roil us all the time is that that's what we still are. We're still these animals and our bodies and our souls react to the wild world around us. We like to pretend that central heating and Wi-Fi connections have somehow put a, a wall of glass between us and, and, and the rest of nature, but it, it's not there. We're still in it. And um, we could start behaving a bit more animal-like again and it wouldn't do us any harm at all. There's a whole aspect of our nature that's, that's it's slid away. The, the part of us that is prepared to be honestly bewildered and which says we don't really know much of what the world is, we don't really know why we have the reactions to it that we do, and that there is a necessity at some point to stand back with that lack of knowing and just stand at the foot of at the foot of the mystery, at the foot of whatever the hell this world is and whatever the, the wildness of it is and our small place in it and to have some awe for that, to have some respect for that, to have a sense of humility before that. If you go to any landscape and you just sit there quietly and listen, what do you hear? What song is the sea singing? Is it different from the song that the sky is singing? And how does it change throughout the day and throughout the seasons? They're not trivial questions. Actually, these are the questions that societies were asking long before we turned in on ourselves. The theologian Thomas Berry, who's a great spiritual ecological writer, has this phrase, the great conversation which he says, 
is the conversation between humans and everything else that lives. And he says, the tragedy of modern humanity is that we've ended the great conversation. We've stopped speaking to everything else that lives and we just speak to ourselves. And we think it's progress and it's not progress. It's a great breakage. So how do you restart the great conversation? And the answer is you start by listening. You just start by shutting up for a minute, which is hard for a writer. You know, I'm very bad at shutting up. Just ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, how do you shut up and listen as a human? How do you come to just a place like this or anywhere and just be quiet, pay attention to what everything else has to say? And then how does that infiltrate into your words, into your conversation? As individual beings, that is necessary work. And as a culture, it's necessary work as well. And it, it's my belief that we can either choose to do that or we can have that forced upon us because we're not we don't get the choice, I don't think, for very long to live as if the rest of the world wasn't alive. Most of the novels we produce and the films we produce and all of the narrative material we produce at the moment is obviously very centred on humans, largely having relations with other humans. The question is, how can you start to tell stories differently? What would the world would look like if you told a story that wasn't about endless human progress, didn't have humans right at the heart of everything, and wasn't just about people. What other stories would you be telling if you had all of the other perspectives in there? And if you listen to an old fairy tale, or if you listen to indigenous people telling a lot of their old myths, that's what their stories are like. That is what the oldest human stories are like. They're not just all about people talking to other people about people and their internal world. That's a very modern, very Western notion. The oldest stories are always about places. They're always about speaking animals. They're always about gods. They're about all these different ways of representing and personifying the rest of life. How can we start to do that again? What happens if we tell stories differently? If there's, if there's any answer for me about how we not necessarily get out of the mess we're in, but at least move on to a different place, it's, how, it's that one. How do we tell stories differently? And how, what, what stories would we tell if we wanted to believe that the world was not just a human playground Once you drop from your shoulders the self-imposed burden of having to save the world from everything, uh, you can kind of breathe a sigh of relief and say, ah, OK, well, what can I actually still do? And, it, it, yeah, well, for me anyway, I can't speak for anyone else, but for me it comes down to uh, the work you have to do on yourself. Um, what values have you got? What sort of person do you want to be? How can you use what few skills you have got to... Um, yeah, do what you need to do. Plant trees, cut the grass, whatever it is that you have the skills and the ability to do. Oh, I'm a